It is a bright morning in 1959, and the peaceful, racist American utopia of Suburbicon is in for a shock. With a smile on his face, the town's chirpy mailman sets out to finish his duties. He is excited to finally meet the newest arrivals, the mayors. He asks one of the residents, Mrs. Pendleton, whether she has met them yet, and learns that they have apparently moved in late last night and that she is baking them a custard. Upon reaching their house, he is greeted by a cheerful black woman. He requests her to fetch Mrs. Mayers, only to be informed that he is speaking with her. Taken aback by the disruption of the all-white color scheme, he immediately notifies the neighbors. Suburbicon is a diverse place, but only for white Americans. Once the shock of the African American's arrival fades, it is replaced with anger. In the town meeting, all the male residents are yelling and creating chaos. They advocate that their town is meant to be a haven for white Americans. The head of the Betterment Committee assures them that they will take all necessary steps and that the neighboring houses will be provided fencing free of cost to block out the view of the mayors. A petition is presented that states that the black community is full of animals who refuse to better themselves and hence must not be allowed till they can prove their worth. Rose Lodge and her identical twin sister Margaret are sitting on the porch of Rose's house. Rose is paraplegic and confined to a wheelchair. She is worried that the property prices in the neighborhood will drop, making it difficult for her and her husband to sell the house and move. Right next to them, Rose's son Nicky is playing with soldier figurines. He is a simple boy who loves his mom and his aunt. Nicky does not have a lot of friends and instead prefers to keep to himself. Maggie asks Nicky to go play baseball with the mayor's boy who was around the same age as him. Being an introvert, he is reluctant but obeys when he is bribed with some butter cookies. Approaching the fence between the two fences, Nicky calls out to Andy. He asks him whether he plays baseball and invites him to play behind the Nazarene church. The two boys make their way towards the church, causing a lot of heads to turn in their direction. Later that night, Nikki and Andy are tucked into their respective beds, listening to the radio. Outside the mayor's house, men are patrolling to keep the family in check. Nikki notices a commotion outside his bedroom, and shortly after, his father, accompanied by some strange man, enters his room telling him to wake up. He tells them that there are intruders in the house and that he needs to come downstairs. Nikki's father, Gardner, is a simple, mild-mannered family man. He loves his wife and son, or does he? When Nikki gets downstairs, he finds his mother, his aunt, and a fat guy who is sitting in Rose's wheelchair. They are being robbed. Sloan, the fat guy in the wheelchair, and Lewis, the tall, slender man who went with Gardner to wake Nikki up, order Gardner to make them a drink and serve it on a tray. After downing his, Lewis plops on the couch next to Nikki and Maggie, while Sloan asks Rose to put her hands around him so that he can transfer her to the wheelchair. Being the loving husband that he is, Gardner growls to Sloan that he will be the one to carry his wife. The tension between Rose and Gardner is evident when she looks him in the eye and mentions that she does not mind being lifted by a strange man. Sloan asks Rose whether she has polio and is informed that she had been in a car accident. Gardner was driving. Thankfully, no one died. Awkward and confused, Sloan gets up from his seat and moves on to do the work that he came for. The thieves tie the family to chairs. Gardner clarifies the agreement that they had. If the lodges cooperate with the thieves, they will not harm the family. Sloan smugly reminds him that harm cannot always be predicted. Lewis and he then go on to pour some chloroform on a napkin. Starting with Maggie and then Gardner, they knock the family out. When Rose's turn comes, Sloan pours thrice the amount he used with others. Nikki sees this as he is being knocked down and struggles to the very last death, seeing his mother flail for her life. Nikki wakes up in the hospital. He can hear his aunt and dad talking to the doctor. The doctor informs them that due to her medication and the effect of chloroform, Rose's organs are failing. Nikki looks to his right and sees his mother breathing through a respirator. She is still alive, but not for long. The young boy has lost his mother. At the funeral of Rose Lodge, friends and family come to pay their respects. Maggie is crying uncontrollably. Gardner and Nikki look lost. Present is also Rose's brother Mitch, a caring uncle who loves Nikki like his own son. He is a Catholic who does not like Episcopalians. He reminds Nikki that even though his path seems bleak, he cannot pull a long face and sulk. He stuffs Nikki's pockets with coins and then starts to bounce the kid over his shoulder. Gardner and Maggie approach them in the car and ask the two to get in. On the way home, 
Gardner informs Nikki that Maggie will be staying with them for a while to help out. Mitch is furious and swears to skin the person who killed his little sister. Maggie asks him to shut up as Nikki is sitting right there. Back at home, Maggie starts preparing a snack for Nikki and Gardner moves into the basement, vacating his bedroom for Maggie to stay in. He tells Nikki that everything will be okay and that they will figure it out together. The father-son duo sit together in silence while watching television. Nikki rolls his mother's wheelchair to the porch. Andy sees him and calls out. He gives him a ground snake to cheer him up. At night, Nikki is struggling to fall asleep and keeps staring at the ground snake. He hears noises downstairs, scared. He runs out of his room and calls out to his father. Gardner comes out from the kitchen with Maggie and asks her to put the child to bed. While putting him to sleep, Maggie tells Nikki that he is part Irish on his mother's side and St. Patrick is his patron saint. They pray to him together. The next morning, Maggie and Nikki leave home to go to the grocery store where Maggie works. At the bus stop, they run into a group of Suburbiconian housewives who express their condolences. Mrs. Pendleton mentions that Suburbicon has always been a safe place until the mayors moved in and blames them for what happened to Rose Lodge. Nikki goes to the store with Maggie and helps her out by filling the baskets of customers. Gardner goes back to work. He is greeted by a bunch of long faces, all saddened by the untimely death of Rose. After getting calls from colleagues expressing their deepest regards, Gardner orders his secretary Linda to hold all his calls. He then receives a call from the captain of the local police department. The man, Hightower, informs him that they have caught two men that match the description of his wife's killers. He requests him to come over and take a look. At the police station, Gardner sees Maggie, who has brought Nikki along with her. Not wanting his child to be subjected to this scarring process, Gardner requests the captain to let Nikki sit this one out. The captain obliges and the adults move into the room to identify the robbers. Maggie and Gardner take a close look at the lineup of criminals. Curious and impatient, Nikki breaks into the room wanting to see the men for himself. Immediately, he recognizes Sloane and Lewis. To his surprise, his father and aunt don't acknowledge the two. Nikki is taken aback and doesn't understand what's happening. One of the policemen accidentally switches on the light of the room, making Nikki's presence known to Gardner, Maggie, and the killers. The kid is escorted out of the room, but it's too late. Sloane has already seen him. The drive from the police station to home is awkward for Nikki. His father and aunt speak about everything other than the fact that those were the men who killed his mother. Maggie mentions that life has a lot of hurdles, including Rose's accident, Gardner losing all his life savings, and Rose's death, but she is positive that the three of them will overcome it as a family. Gardner enters the bathroom to talk to Nikki while he is taking a bath. He asks his son how he is feeling and takes a seat near him. Nikki asks his father why he pretended not to recognize the killers. The boy's father tells him that sometimes they think they recognize someone when they actually have never seen them in their life. When Nikki tries to retaliate, he shuts him down by saying he doesn't know what he is talking about. After this, he leaves the bathroom. Maggie is starting to take her sister's place. She wears her pearls and gets her hair dyed blonde, making herself resemble Rose physically. She can finally be with Gardner, something she had always dreamt of. Mitch is concerned about his nephew. He does not trust his Episcopalian brother-in-law and believes that the environment of the lodge house is not good for Nikki. But when he sees clerical guidance, the pre Priest tells him to stay out of their familial business until the kid complains. One day, after baseball, Nikki discovers pamphlets of military training boarding schools in his house. As he is rummaging through them, he hears screams and noises from the basement. He grabs a knife and slowly makes his way down there. Fearfully, he switches on the basement light, only to find his aunt and father having sex. Shocked, Nikki turns the light back off and walks away. Disappointed by what he has discovered, Nikki refuses to have dinner with his aunt and tells her he does not want her to stay in the house anymore. Angry at the boy's response, Rose tells him that he is being silly and he will only have the right to refuse a meal when he starts to earn money for himself. Afraid of his aunt and father, Nikki tries to call Mitch for help. He is unable to reach him. Back at Gardner's office, Sloane and Lewis decide to pay him a visit. Instead of a handshake, Gardner is greeted with a punch to his face. Sloane asks him to take care of his son and pay up for the crime that Gardner hired them for. After being left alone and all bruised, he gets a call from Mitch informing him that Mrs. Lodge called and left a message for him. Knowing that it was him who called and furious, Gardner has a little chat with Nikki. He tells him that his mother had indulged him his entire life 
and it is time for him to grow up. He officially informs Nikki about his decision to send him to boarding school. All the while Andy and Nikki grow close, the Suburbiconians were making the mayor's lives difficult. At the supermarket, they hiked up the price of every item so that Mrs. Mayers was unable to buy groceries. Every night, they stand outside their house singing songs and laughing loudly, making it near impossible for the family to sleep. Gardner sneaks into Maggie's room to spend the night. He tells her that as soon as they get Rose's insurance money, the two of them will run away to Aruba, which is a Dutch protectorate. There, they will be free to be together out in the open. Maggie has never been happier. She has the love of her life with her, and nothing is standing in their way. Gardner is visited by Captain Hightower at his office. He is informed that a man named Frank Rizzoli is dead, and he was found in possession of something that linked him to Mr. Lodge. Frank was apparently a loan shark of the mob and had to collect 7,000 apples from Gardner Lodge. Gardner tells him that he has never heard of this man. The captain is not convinced, but agrees to keep looking for Rose's killers. Maggie hosts a very suspicious and cocky insurance claim agent, Bud Cooper. He is convinced that Lodge has killed his wife for the insurance money. Maggie, acting confused and awkward, is not helping the situation. She tells Cooper that Gardner has been late to pay the insurance dues because he lost all of their life savings. Cooper catches Maggie in a lie by asking her why Gardner increased the amount of Rose's insurance when he did not actually. Before he leaves, he tells Maggie that he will be back in the evening to have a chat with Gardner. Sloan orders his partner to go to the lodge house and kill Maggie and Nikki. Lewis is reluctant. He does not want more blood on his hands, but Sloan leaves him no choice. This is their only option to get Gardner to pay up. When Gardner gets home, Maggie tells him about Bud Cooper and the lies he told to confuse her. Soon after that, they are again visited by Bud, who seems amused by the commotion outside the mayor's house. He asks Maggie to make him a cup of coffee and starts to discuss the life insurance policy with Gardner. In an effort to strike a deal, Cooper tells Lodge that he will not report him to the police if he gives all of the insurance money to Cooper. Gardner does not take well to being challenged. He threatens to kill Cooper, but the threat falls flat. Waiting for Gardner to make a decision, Cooper takes a sip of his coffee and screams. Maggie has poisoned the coffee by adding lye to it. To ease the burning, Cooper drinks water, but it does not make any difference. He runs out on the street to get some air, but is followed by Gardner holding a fireplace poker. Gardner knocks Cooper out by hitting him on the head and then stabs him in the face. The commotion outside the mayor's house has become a riot. People are yelling and throwing stones in order to injure the family. They set fire to their car and hang a Confederate flag from a broken window. Gardner takes advantage of this chaos and stuffs Cooper into the trunk of his own car. He drives him to an abandoned location and leaves him there. At home, Maggie crushes pills and adds them to Nikki's food. She goes upstairs to his room, but the kid refuses to respond to his aunt. He calls up his uncle Mitch and notifies him that he is in danger. Lewis barges into the house. Maggie tries to tell him about Aruba and her plans for the future, but is not allowed to finish as the man kills her. He makes his way up to Nikki's room and breaks open the lock. He finds the boy hiding under the bed. As Lewis is trying to grab Nikki, he is suddenly pulled back and slammed on the bed. Nikki is crying and screaming. After a few minutes of struggling and fighting, a hand covered in blood reaches out to help Nikki out. It is his Uncle Mitch. He tells Nikki to hide in a closet near the stairs, gives him a gun, and asks him to stay there. After that, he promptly dies from the stab wound Lewis left him with. While cycling his way back to Suburbicon after disposing of Bud's body, Gardner runs into Sloan. The criminal tells him that he has a surprise waiting for him at home and demands the money. Suddenly, a large truck rams into Sloan's car, killing him. Gardner cycles away and upon reaching home, finds Maggie, Lewis, and Mitch dead. He cannot find Nikki at first, but soon notices the blood on the knob of the closet. The kid points a gun at his father. Gardner tells Nikki to come out and sits him down at the dining table to have a chat. While discussing what he should do next with Nikki, Gardner eats the sandwich that Maggie made earlier. He tells his son that he has two options. Option one, Gardner shoots Nikki and tells the cops that Lewis did it. Or option number two, Nikki agrees to lie to the police to save his father, and then the two of them can go 
to Aruba, he asks him to make a choice. The next morning, the crowd outside the mayor's house is gone, and the news reporters have arrived. A woman is seen blaming the mayors for everything that has gone wrong with Suburbicon recently. Nicky is sitting at home watching television, while his father is dead at the dining table because of the drugged sandwich. Nicky walks to his porch, sees Andy playing catch, and grabs his baseball mitten. The two boys throw the ball back and forth, while the camera zooms out. Suburbicon seems as quiet and peaceful as before.